Hello, I'm Maddie Hale and this is Mad World. Welcome to 2024, the year the world goes insane. Two billion people go to vote, the US puts itself on the brink of another civil war and we all watch it through our phones. That is, until TikTok gets banned for good. This week, Elon Musk goes to war with Disney and threatens to burn down the House of Mouse. President Biden speaks to dead people and the Canadian bill that could get you jailed for speaking well of oil and gas. I'll be joined throughout the show to make sense of all of this by former government advisor James Price and The Telegraph's Madeleine Grant. Thanks for joining me. First up, it's Hollywood versus Silicon Valley as Elon Musk wades into a row over alleged left-wing bias at Disney. The House of Mouse parted ways with The Mandalorian star Gina Carano in 2021 due to her conservative views. Carano has lashed out at Disney on Fox News. I mean, you were at one of the biggest perches in the entertainment field, and now, next day, you were canceled. What I've learned is that if this can happen to me, this can happen to anyone. I am uh, I'm easy to work with, and I am passionate about what we do. I am always excited to be on set. I even worked with them as much as I possibly could to resolve any issues that they had. But, you know, eventually you have a line and, you know, when that line gets crossed, you just have to say enough, enough is enough. Now she's taking Disney to court and she has the backing of Musk, who is at this time of the recording, the richest person in the world. Now Musk has gone further, hinting to reporters that he might be looking to acquire Disney. You look like a pilot. Thanks, so I'm a pilot. Oh! <laughs> Looking cool. So what brings you to the Lola carpet? I'm just, uh, just here with friends, you know, thinking about companies to acquire. Musk has sharpened his attacks on Disney in the last week and published an internal diversity and inclusion memo that was doing the rounds of the company. And the general ridicule surrounding Disney has amped up recently, with the film and TV giant being lampooned for its diversity and inclusion efforts by South Park. But then Kennedy's like, it's not our fault, it's because of Kathleen Kennedy. But then Kathleen Kennedy says, like, f it, make it my name. And everyone in town is like, no, please, Kathleen Kennedy, stop ruining everything. But Kathleen Kennedy is all like, put another gay diverse woman in it, make it my name. And the Disney stock just keeps going down and down and down. And then Bob Iger is all like, eh, no, what's going on with my stock? Online commentators have rallied behind Gina Carano, arguing she was merely exercising freedom of speech. Gina Carano was fired because she said that people should be allowed to have dissenting political views. People should be allowed to live in peace, regardless of what their religion is or regardless of what they believe. So, since when do we not agree with that? Disney fired her for saying that. And fans of Elon Musk are getting pretty enthusiastic about the prospect of a hostile takeover of Disney. A fan page has posted this image of the Tesla boss wielding a flamethrower with the caption, Elon Musk purging Disney-like. Now guys, this is obviously not anything new, this whole Disney woke agenda. I'll start with you, James. What did you think of this whole situation? I mean, it, it's that South Park stuff, really. We were laughing about this just, just watching it. Uh, <laughs> you think it's funny, you think maybe South Park are taking the mic, they've gone too far with this. And then you go and try and watch some Disney products of the last couple of years. There was something that came out, I think, called Miss Marvel, is it from the Marvel oh, world, yeah. Disney and that. And it goes on about how evil the British Empire is. And it's about a, you know, a diverse character from new... And it's just, you think, really? This is the kind of entertainment I want. I want robots punching each other at Disney. <laughs> I want a princess meeting a prince. It's the time memorial. These are the kind mm. of nice stories that we want. And instead, we're getting this kind of nonsense sort of mm. forced down our throats. What Crazy. do you... What do you what, Maddie, what do you think about the fact that, you know, when Musk doesn't... Elon Musk doesn't agree with something, he might just buy the company like what he did with Twitter. Do you think that this is actually going to happen? Elon Musk is going to acquire Disney? Well, it's certainly he's certainly putting the cat amongst the pigeons and talking about possibly um, teaming up with um, Nelson Peltz um, to do some kind of hostile takeover. And, of course, he's already very much put his money where, where his mouth was in Twitter, now known as X. Um, a lot of people said, oh, this is a bad business decision by Elon Musk. But I think that really missed the point that what he was trying to do was to take over one of the most influential social media organs in the world and basically make it pro-free speech mm. and not allow the kind of shadow banning, et cetera, that has been a feature of all social media accounts. So for him, it's probably not about making money back on the investment. It's about yeah. promoting a cause that he believes in. And, I think taking, this case... and taking a stand with Gina yeah. Carano by saying, look, I'm going to back you. I'm going to pay yeah. your lawyer's bills because I don't think it's fair that you've been ousted from you know, a franchise that you were so 
you know, well liked in. Yeah, and you know what, like, I think that they have a very good case because it's very obvious that firstly, that other um, cast members in, in, in who are employed by Disney and other producers and so forth are on the record as making arguably even more inflammatory statements than what mm. she made, but from a left-wing perspective. So there's that aspect of it. And secondly, when they announced that they were parting ways with her, they did so in a very uh, emotionally charged way. They didn't just say, we're parting ways and we wish her the best. It was more, they said, we we reject any uh, abhorrent um, use of cultural stereotypes. So this is there's a reason in mm. when people get laid off, they tend to have things said in that impartial way. And I think the, normally, under normal circumstances, what would happen is the person would probably settle out of, out of court. Disney does not want more publicity around this. But when you've got Elon Musk bankrolling you, <laughs> like, I think it could go all the way to the top. And then you would have to, if it ended up in court, Disney would start having to hand over sensitive communications mm. that relate to this case, which would also reflect very badly on them. So, mm. you know, I think, I don't think Elon Musk is in this for and money, no object to him. I don't think he's in this simply for an out-of-court mm. settlement. Well, it's funny, because even with that South Park clip and it was showing Bob Iger kind of falling through whatever he was falling through, it's it's funny because he was brought back in to the company to kind of steer them away from this go woke, go broke agenda that had happened because Disney had lost $150 billion in the last however long since their heyday and the profits had plummeted 45% or something ridiculous like that under the former CEO, Bob Chapek, for whatever woke ideologies they had kind of invested in. So it kind of begs the question, is there a future for Disney? Is this, are they, sat, like, can this be saved? Well, I think the problem is Bob Iger, as you say, he was in there, this other chap comes in, Iger is brought back again. Even if you are someone at the top of one of these organisations, if the woke mind virus gets so infiltrated all the way through a system, mm. it's very hard to get that kind of root and branch reform to get it out. I think, I think people talking about this as a virus is actually quite a useful way to think about it because once it gets in there, it's not about making profit mm -hmm. for these people, right? These people don't care about this stuff. They've been told since the time at university that diversity and equity and inclusion is the best thing ever and that to be a racist is the worst thing in the world and racism means whatever you want it to mean, all this kind of stuff. Once it gets there, the profit motive goes out the window mm -hmm. and all you have is this kind of destructive point. And, and Mantis makes a great point about Elon Musk. The guy is trying to make the, the, um, the, the human race a multi-planetary species and has got all these other amazing things about getting us off into Mars and all the rest of it. And he looks down at home, he sees, as most of us do, this mind virus is taking over all these institutions. Mm. And if he can get things like Twitter and Disney and try and uh, turn the culture back towards some kind of sanity, then he, people like him can get back to work on the serious and important things of getting us off into the stars. Well, it's definitely something we're going to be watching closely because the the whatever happens with this case will be such a example of, you know, is it right or is it wrong? How do we kind of steer the line? How do we make sure that you know, female actresses or female actors, any, any actors are kind of protected with that freedom of speech. We're going to move on, guys, but we're going to stay in the United States. President Joe Biden's weekly gaffes are getting more concerning, but arguably funnier by the week. The 81-year-old commander-in-chief has taken it to new levels this week, essentially declaring that he can speak to dead people. The president mentioned a conversation with the French president. The problem was he mentioned Francois Mouderan, who died in 1996. Sat down and I said, America's back. And Mitterrand from Germany, I mean from France, looked at me and said, uh, said, you know, what, why, how, how long are you back for? His press secretary, Karine Jean Pierre, was typically open and transparent about the situation. How is President Biden ever going to convince the three quarters of voters who are worried about his physical and mental health that he is okay? even though in Las Vegas he told a story about recently talking to a French president who died in 1996. I'm not even going to go down that rabbit hole with you, what? sir. What is We're the gonna rabbit go. hole? Go ahead. He said go he ahead. talked to Mitterrand. Go ahead. In you saw the president in Vegas, in California. You've seen the president in South Carolina. You saw him in Mich Michigan. I'll just leave it there. <laughs> it's not just the French who Biden has struggled with. He also recalled a 2021 conversation with the German chancellor, just not quite the right one. The president was quoted mixing up then-Chancellor Angela Merkel with Helmut Kohl, who died four years earlier in 2017. Now, Biden has a past form for this. Here he is in 2022, searching the room for Congresswoman Jackie Walorski. And I want to thank all of you here, for in including bipartisan elected officials like Representative Governor, Senator Braun, Senator Booker, Representative... Jackie, are you here? Where's Jackie? 
I didn't think she was, she was going to be here. The problem was she had died the month before in a car accident and the president and the first lady had already paid tribute to her. But what do we think of this? Is Biden, <laughs> this is getting worse and worse. Is Biden speak to dead people? I think this is it's just so uh, upsetting in a way. It's, yeah. it's almost funny. And then you realise that this guy is... Is it, is it that his handlers are trying to keep him going because they're the ones secretly mm. running things behind the scenes and they love the taste of power? Or is it a guy who is aware that he's losing his sort of sharpness or very much almost lost it at this point, but is determined to kind of fight on in a kind of King Lear type way? I think that's mm. a big problem. The other bit is that clip you just shown of the, of the spokesperson there saying, oh, I'm not going to go down this rabbit hole. You saw him here. That's one of the worst bits for yeah. me, right? They mm. don't get Prime Minister's questions in America. The best they've got are these daily press briefings with the press secretary like that answering questions. And when you've got, I suppose, you can't defend the indefensible. She just refuses to talk mm. about it. I think that's really dangerous as it well. It does. Uh, I've covered this a few times, but it does make you understand, make you question. In 2021, the White House reporters actually filed a complaint with the White House about the lack of questions they were allowed to ask Joe Biden. And obviously, nothing, not everything needs to be related back to Trump. But it is a stark contrast. So you can say whatever you want about Donald Trump, but at least he faced the media and took questions, regardless of his answers. Like, at least he took the questions. But I agree with you, James. Corinne Jean-Pierre just ignoring probably one of the biggest things that will go on voter minds in November is his age and his cognitive abilities. What do you think, Maddie? I completely agree with, with James. I mean, firstly, I think very harsh on King Lear there. But, <laughs> but, but, but I, I mean, it's, it speaks to the profound arrogance within the Democratic Party high command that they basically take the view that, you know, it's a bit, it's bad form of journalists to, to ask mm. questions. Um, I mean, why should anyone be bothered that, you know, the leader of the free world um, is making the most basic mistakes with, with recall and eloquence? Mm. You know, we, we, here in the UK, we have um, perhaps not the most awe-inspiring crop of politicians, but <laughs> I really came to the fore when Rishi Sunak was, was out there um, visiting Joe Biden and the fact that he had to sit with cue cards that he basically read off. And this was just a kind of fireside chat mm. between two supposedly friends. You know, it wasn't a hostile press conference. And even that had to be stage managed to such a degree. And I think it's steeply arrogant because there were clearly people in the Democrat Party who were benefiting from this. They are the ones pulling mm. the strings. And, you know, they would rather maintain perhaps the power that they have, the influence that they have, rather than... Um, you know, even face the possibility that the party might look elsewhere for a candidate. Yeah, exactly and, and, right. And on that as well, the, the, this idea of how staged managed American politics is going to. When I was in government, we, we'd made a visit to DC and in a meeting with Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen. It is exactly as you say, they've got the cue cards there and they even have to her. do this. Oh yeah, they let, they let the, the uh, media come in, they do a bit of a pool filming of it all and you do a bit of back and forth for the cameras. They go away again, mm. things relax a little bit. But that mindset of, oh, you're on all this yeah. time, and it's every yeah. word counts, it kind of seeps through and it's very stage managed. Yeah. The fact that this guy can't even get someone's name right, who's died yeah. nearly 30 years ago. I mean, because Terrible. obviously you are, you're getting prompted all the way through. You would think that they can get these name rights or at least understand who's alive and who's dead. But I think it should be noted with the Corinne Jean-Pierre clip that Fox News White House correspondent Peter Ducey, he's public enemy number one for the White House because he asks probably all the hard-hitting questions that Republican constituents want to want answered. Yeah. He was the one that Biden was caught in a hot mic moment calling a son of a... Because, <laughs> oh, my goodness. Yeah, because he was asking questions about whether he had anything to do with Hunter Biden's business deal. So, but I do want to, before we move on, I do want to ask you guys what you think about the fact that, you know, we're months away from the November election. Do you think there's a chance that the Democratic Party could replace him? And if so, do you think there's anyone that they could put put their hand up? Yeah, I mean, basically, I, I think they have now... It's very, very difficult to dislodge the president if he's not willing to resign himself. Mm. Ultimately, it, it most likely comes down to Joe Biden. I'm sure there'll be a lot of manoeuvring at the Democratic Convention next. But ultimately, I think without the... My understanding is that this late stage without the president volu voluntarily stepping down is very difficult. And... You know, the indications are that um, those close to Biden, for example, Jill Biden, who was interviewed a couple of days ago, are maintaining the current facade that he's he's doing absolutely fine and dandy, thank you mm. very much, and he's at the, um, the, the height of his powers and abilities. Mm. Um, so it looks like they're still in that bunker mode. Yeah, it is a bit of an actions speak louder than the words situation. Justin Trudeau's reign over Canada has already seen the Liberal leader referred to as a dictator. But in a surprising twist, 
Trudeau isn't looking too left-leaning after news surfaced this week that a new bill proposed by Charlie Angus, an MP from the opposition NDP party, wants to jail Canadians who speak well of fossil fuels. Bill C-372 will, quote, provide a legislative response to a national public health and environmental problem of substantial and pressing concerns. The bill will make it illegal for big oil and gas lobby and the gas lobby or their front groups or paid influencers to falsely promote the burning of fossil fuels as a benefit to the public. The bill would set out a fine of up to $500,000 for individual offenders, but it's even worse for companies that do this. Violating the law could result in two years in jail or a fine of $1 million. One Canadian publication has torn the bill apart online. You're not allowed to say that a fossil fuel is less harmful than other fossil fuels, even if that's true. Natural gas, for instance, is generally cleaner than burning coal or tar. You also can't say that selling or using oil is good for the economy or that fossil fuel extraction can be beneficial to indigenous people, which again, can both be true. But regardless, the bill proposes that if you do any of this, you get up to two years in jail or a $1 million fine. Meanwhile, social media users have ridiculed the idea, with one meme showing a convict being asked, what are you in for? The other says, I said the oil and gas sector was good for the Canadian economy. <laughs> Trudeau might be breathing a sigh of relief, at least the heat is off him for the moment, but he did make an outrageous gaffe in the Canadian Parliament this week. Here from the Leader of the Opposition is uh, under the previous Conservative government, everything was perfect and what he is proposing to do is to make Canada great again. That is not what Canadians want. They don't want Canada to be great again. <laughs> what did you make of that, James, that new proposal? You, would you be voting that in? I, I, I'm almost speechless at this, right? <laughs> that, that bloke has been selected from amongst his peers as a <laughs> to try and come up with laws on these things. And I think this is the problem, that so much now is, is being put by legislators into the too difficult box. Mm. Um, you know, so the idea about climate change or about how net zero and all these things, they're very big things to actually work out. Probably the answer to this is going to be a mixture of more efficient uses of this stuff and exciting new technologies that are going to make energy clean and cheap mm. and free. And we're going to look back on this in, in 50 years or 100 years or something and say, what were we so worried about because the fusion reactor or something came along? But of course, me saying that will probably now put me in prison <laughs> in Canada for even saying this. And so it's, it's doing these sorts of stupid nonsense laws yeah. mm. to go and try and police speech and the rest of it mm. because it gets them some woke points amongst the kind of chattering classes without bothering to actually address any of the substantive when it's problems. Actually completely unlikely that it would ever get passed through. What's the point? Like, if you want to, if we want to focus on climate change, let's actually start putting, implementing proper things that combat climate change. What did you think about this, Maddie? It's just unbelievably insane. <laughs> it's cosmically insane. It's, I mean, it's, it's, it's almost too mad for this show, Mad World. You know? it's, <laughs> and we didn't think we'd get there. It's, it's, it's jumped the shark. Um, it's just, it's, I, I, I'm kind of speechless too. But the thing that gets me is the fact that, you know, that the law is not about actually using fossil fuels. It's kind of understood that we still mm -hmm. need to use fossil fuels, that, West, uh, that advanced economies depend for their most basic functions on fossil fuels. There's no objection to that, but you're not allowed to say that. So it's the kind of the, the, the attempt to kind of legislate against reality when you have lost the argument or you fear you may be losing it because that is all they have. Well, it was modelled after the tobacco bill, trying to obviously phase out advertising of cigarettes, which is completely understandable why any government would be wanting to do that. But this was modelled after that to stop yeah. advertisement, to stop promotion of fossil fuels. So it's an interesting kind of contrast that this Charlie Angus wants to follow in the suit of this. We, we can take this down the, the rabbit hole that uh, Karen Jean-Pierre didn't want us to go down any rabbit holes in the previous section. What other things were there that we would try and block? So it's bad that Russia has invaded Ukraine. So we're not going to give any more support to that. Yes. But we'll say it's illegal to talk about invading Ukraine. Right? Mm, yeah. That's the same level Out of, of sight, this absolute rot. Yeah, exactly. It's not going to work. Exactly. Yeah, and yeah, then when, yeah. all, when all the lights stop going on and the generators and the backup generators in hospitals start turning off, mm. you go, oh, maybe we should add some more fossil fuel. Get in prison, you bigot. <laughs> it's absolutely yeah. And who cares about overcrowding? Yeah. Well, guys, we're actually going to go to Australia now, so Ooh. off to my hometown. And it looks like I'm actually moving home. After reading this news, <laughs> the Prime Minister, Anthony Albanese, will likely pass a new law that gives workers the right to ignore their bosses after hours. The right to disconnect was proposed as a parliamentary bill to allow workers to have a healthy work-life balance and be able to switch off work mode. The bill has been pushed by the Australian Green Party, who published this mildly cringeworthy video to get their point across. Answer the phone. I want 
Hi, boss. Why aren't you answering your emails? Ah, uh, yeah, nah, I'm, uh, I'm clocked off. I was just filming a video on workers' rights to disconnect, actually. What the hell is that? Oh, uh, it ensures workers aren't required to read or respond to emails, phone calls, or any other kind of unnecessary communication from their employers outside of work hours. It also would mean employers could face fines if they fail to allow employees to actually embrace their newfound freedom. But not everyone is happy with a number of media commentators pointing out that this law risks a major overreach of state powers. I'm still scarred with some of the stuff that Labor does in the parliament historically. But you've been right to remind me they're back to all their old tricks. They're ramming stuff through. There's no proper debate on the legislation. There's limited scrutiny. And Michaela Cash was making the point that this uh, likelihood now a small business owners being liable with prison sentences. Labor let this legislation, this, this amendment go through. They're trying to blame everyone else. Now they're trying to mop it up. This is obviously a hotly contested subject in Australian politics. What did you guys think? Do you think this is more for snowflake Gen Z <laughs> or something that we people could embrace? Well, I just think it's there's got to be some freedom for companies to operate mm. as they see fit. I mean, where would the world be? You know, where would we be as a civilization if every time any new advancement was made, any new company basically said, right, it would stop at 5 p.m. and there will mm. be no communication ever again? That's not how things function. Mm. I think only a very comfortable company can afford to operate like that. And, you know, the, the idea that you, there are different kinds of workplaces, if, if you, I'm sure there are many workplaces that have a more, um, more flexibility and more, um, more, more kindly working hours than other places. But the point is, there's got to be the element of workers picking and choosing based mm. on their own preferences and, and desires. This basically says one size fit, fits all policy on all yeah. work workforces and which obviously yeah. could never happen because there are a million different industries with a million different hours. What exactly. do you think, James? This is something that you can embrace as a former advisor. This, <laughs> this would never happen to you. So when, when I was the chief of staff to the chancellor, he'd be the first person I spoke to in the morning and the last person when I went to bed at night, and that would be with my partner in bed next to me, right? <laughs> so there's, there's, no, there's no getting away from this kind of stuff. I bet you the people that came up with this nonsense have never actually worked in the private sector before. No. This yeah. is only something that could work if you're, if you're in a government department or something yeah. like that, and you're a civil servant with a really cushy pension. That is true. Right? It, is not the, how it, it is for the civil exactly. servants. Right. I mean, ditto with, for, for example, a newspaper. You know, we, we go to print at certain times, but then if something there's a massive news that blows up at 6 p.m. We then have to rethink the entire paper. We might have to do a whole new cover. People are bashing out stories at sort of right down to the wire at 8 p.m. And it's very stressful. It can be very exhilarating mm. too. But, you know, I just, as, as James said, this shows zero awareness of, of how jobs and, and the, the job market really operate. Right, but also that's fun, right? What, yeah. what might I yeah. describe there? Not every day, but a big news story comes in, you're a journalist, you work in a newspaper. It's an yeah. exciting, it's it a is. privilege to do yeah. that kind of stuff. Yeah. And th th that idiotic video there, that little rat bag, uh, but he's obviously never worked in these kind of things before. Mm. Bosses don't talk like that, mm. right? Capitalism is human and creative and wonderful. Mm. And normally you know, we've all had bad bosses. But bosses, especially in small businesses, care about their employees as much as they care about their own families, right? Mm. Because everybody wins together on these kinds of things. Or put and it in something nonsense. more like practical in the sense that workers have more rights to, I don't know, stand up for themselves if they do have a tyrant yes. boss or they do have someone that's, you know, abusive. But that's all from us on Mad World this week. Thanks to James and Madeline, and thank you for watching. And don't forget to like, share, and subscribe.